Okay, so thank you again, everybody, for dialing in tonight as uh, we present this next episode in the 2024 Set of Play series. Um, as I just mentioned, my name is Derek Stein, and I'm filling in for Gethin tonight as the moderator. Um, some of you may have recognized me. I am a, a medical researcher at the University of Queensland, uh, and my group conducts research alongside people with motor neuron disease. And our goal is to improve our understanding of the variability and the heterogeneity across the spectrum of MNDs. Um, now, for those of you who are on Zoom tonight, you may see a notification about the meeting being recorded. Um, can I ask you to please just click OK um, or agree to continue? Um, and um, assuming that's OK with you. Um, now, before we start, I and the MD Australia would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and the connections to land, sea and community. Um, we pay our respects to their elders, past, present and future, and we extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the Yagura people on whose land I am, and I pay respect to the elders, past, present and emerging, and extend a very warm welcome to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples um, on this call today. Now tonight we're doing something slightly different. Um, we're going to take uh, somewhat of a futuristic look. Um, and I say futuristic, but really it's happening today. Uh, as some of the project that's currently underway in Australia, uh, we have two wonderful speakers tonight. Uh, we have Ben O'Mara and his team talking about Game On with MND. Uh, this is a project looking at how we can make computer gaming more accessible for people with MND. And we also have Dr. Da uh, Taylor Dick from University of Queensland, um, who will be talking about exoskeletons as uh, mobility aids. Now, as with previous State of Play presentations, each presenter will talk for about 20 minutes and then we'll have a combined Q&A session at the end of the, of the evening. Um, there's actually going to be quite a lot happening during the talks tonight. I'm aware that there's a few people who's going to be joining Ben during his discussion as well. Um, so what I would like to do is just get you to submit your questions throughout the chat uh, or the Q&A function in the Zoom um, or through comments if you are watching through Facebook. Um, also, you do not need to wait until the end to submit any of your questions. You can just enter them straight into the chat or the Q&A or the comment sections during the talk. Um, and that might actually be a really good thing because we'll give an opportunity for some of our speakers and some of the people presenting tonight uh, to prepare. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to a lively discussion towards the end of the session tonight. And so what I'm going to do now is actually hand over to Taylor. Um, I will get Taylor to introduce her work. And um, thank you very much again for joining us. And I'm looking forward to some good discussion. Can you see my screen okay there, Derek? Uh, yes, thank you. Perfect, thank you. And thanks, Derek, for the nice introduction and to the MNDRA for the invitation to share some of our, our recent and ongoing work in this space. It's a, it's a treat to be here. Um, now, I want to start my talk by by giving full disclosure that I, I'm not an expert in, in MND. In fact, I'm, I'm very new to the MND field, but I'm really excited and perhaps most excited um, about this, this aspect of, of my research program. I'm still learning a lot about motor neuron disease, but through collaborations with, with leaders in the field and, and lots of interactions with people living with MND, I'm hoping that my work will have a, have a future impact. And so before I get going, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we, well, I meet today um, in Brisbane. I'd like to pay my respect to their ancestors and their descendants, who are the Turbo and Yagra people, and acknowledge their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So just a bit of a, a brief overview of my of my presentation. I have a bit about 20 minutes or so. And what I hope to do is first talk very briefly about me and my research. Then I'll cover mobility aids more broadly in motor neuron disease, where we're at in the field and in Australia. Then I'll discuss a little bit about how we can characterize movement or movement signatures in MND. And then finally talk about this new area of wearable robotic ankle exoskeletons to, to improve movement. So um, starting off, I, I'm, I'm Canadian. I did my PhD in Vancouver before moving to the US for a postdoc and then finding my, my way to beautiful Australia and Brisbane. Um, and at UQ, I lead a research group called the Neuromuscular Biomechanics Lab. And so my team is a diverse group of, of people with backgrounds in exercise sciences, biology, engineering, math, physics. 
And the overarching goal of our work is to understand how essentially the brain and the muscles coordinate um, movement. And we do this via three pillars or aims of research. We're interested in using experiments and models together to understand motion and, and motor function. We're really interested in links between form and function. So exploring how the anatomy, the brain and our biomechanics integrate and adapt to challenges as a result of, of, of disease and, and pathology. And then finally, I'm, I'm a bit of a wannabe engineer. I'm really interested in understanding how we can use this information to guide the bio-inspiration of, of new technologies that can assist people move. Um, so that's a little bit about what, what we do. And I need to start off by convincing all of you that skeletal muscle is the most exciting and most interesting tissue in, in the whole body. So muscle is the universal biological motor. It powers movement amongst many other, other tasks. And we have really compelling evidence that declines in, in muscle function as a result of disease or pathology lead to impairments in, in mobility, independence, and in quality of life. But we also know that targeted interventions designed to positively alter muscle properties or devices such as prosthetics and exoskeletons that behave a bit like our muscles are capable of, of enhancing or, or improving our movements. And so let's get into a little bit about motor neuron disease. And, and so this is a progressive neurogenerative disease affecting the motor neurons in, in the human body. And there's many different subtypes or clinical phenotypes of this disease. And, and the pre presentation of it is, is very heterogeneous, meaning it varies a lot across individuals with motor neuron disease. And in the context of, of movement, individuals with motor neuron disease often experience gradual muscle weakness and loss of voluntary motor control, leading to, to difficulties with mo movement and, and daily activities. Um, and, and so to overcome this muscle weakness, often movement patterns can change. So for example, individuals might hike their hips or drag their feet on the ground. But what this leads to is, is gait that is slow, asymmetrical, and can be quite tiring. And, and while not yet formally measured or assessed in motor neuron disease, this contributes to movement declines in other neuromuscular disorders, such as stroke um, and cerebral palsy. You? But we know very little about movement uh, in enemies. Mute. And so one way to support movement um, as it becomes impaired is via mobility aids. And as a bit of a broad overview, we know that mobility aids play an important role in enhancing independence, safety, and quality of life in people with MND. We know that when they're properly selected and, and utilized, mobility aids can help to mitigate the risk of falls or injuries associated with falls. We also know that access to mobility aids facilitates more participation in activities, employment, and community engagement. And in fact, one study has shown that individuals with motor neuron disease ranked improved mobility and transfers as the area where recovery of function is most desired. So hopefully I've convinced you that, that mo mobility aids are, are critical in, in MND. So then what's currently available? Well, as a bit of a, a broad overview of mobility aids, this list is by no means exhaustive. We have wheelchairs and scooters. These are probably the most common when functional deficits are high. And there's some incredible chairs and scooters out there. Some have advanced features such as tilt in space and power assisted controls for comfort and function. And many of these are often covered in, in different funding schemes for eligible individuals. We also have the more passive walking aids such as canes, walkers, and rollators that help assist movement and in, in balance. Many of these have adjustable features to accommodate varying levels of, of strength and instability. And then finally, we have orthotic devices such as AFOs or ankle foot orthosis or knee ankle foot orthosis that help to support joints when there are muscles that become weaker. And these devices are sometimes personalized for comfort or for the shape of an individual. For example, do they fit nicely into, the, into your shoes? Do they rub on your skin when you move? But one limitation of all of these mobility aids is that they're in some sense passive. Yes, wheelchairs have motors to, to move them forward, but these devices cannot and do not adapt to the person wearing them. 
to the progression of their disease, to the environment in which they're moving. So then the question is, is there something else that we could use to meet these unmet needs? And this is where exoskeletons come in. And now for most of us, including once upon a time myself, if I heard the word exoskeleton, this is probably what comes to mind. The shell of an insect, like a cicada or a crustacean like a crab. And if we just so happen to Google the definition of exoskeleton, we get something like an exoskeleton that is on the exterior of an animal to both support the body, the body shape and protect its internal organs. But if you go to the second hit on Google, what you get is this definition, wearable devices or structures that support and assist movement to enhance the capabilities of the human body. And these are the exoskeletons that I'm going to discuss. Now, we've come away a long way over the past 60 years or so, and, and devices have really moved from fiction to reality. So here's one of the first powered devices from the 1960s. This was developed by GE. It was called Hardy Man. And this exoskeleton was designed to mimic the user's natural movements, but make them super strong. So in other words, allow them to, to, to lift about 700 kilograms. So be 25 times stronger than, than human strength. Um, this was a pretty lofty goal and this prototype completely failed because the weight of just one arm of this system, so not even the full suit, was about 700 kilograms. Now, on the right side, this is what the devices we use in, in my lab and, and in, in the field look like today. So they're pretty sleek, they're less than a kilogram, and they could probably even go under your pants without a person knowing, knowing it's there. So we've really come a long, a long way. And so can we use these types of devices in, in people with motor neuron disease? And, and so I need to highlight that there have been some efforts in the rehabilitation space to use this particular device. It's called HAL, or the Hybrid Assistive Limb. It's designed by this, this Japanese company. But these devices are really bulky. They weigh about 23 kilograms. They're really expensive, and they need careful maintenance because they have many different motors at the hips, at the knees, at the ankles. So we think a better approach is to use these more lightweight devices that provide on-demand assistance at the ankle joint only. Hang on to that thought. I'm going to tell you why the ankle is important in a few slides. And so what this, this device does is it adds just a little bit of spring into each and every step as you walk. It behaves a little bit like our calf muscles and our Achilles tendon. And, and since these devices are portable, they have really exciting potential to assist movement and slow the decline of gait in motor neuron disease. And so this brings me to our wonderful iMove MND team. A few months ago, we were awarded an assistive technology grant from the ALS, ALS Association of the USA, which was really exciting. And, and I want to highlight this is truly a collaborative effort. I'm, I'm super fortunate to have this team of clever, passionate, and kind scientists and clinicians. Um, so I'm leading the project under the, the, the co-leadership of, of Derek and, and Shu No. We have Rob Henderson, Dr. Rob Henderson, who's um, a, a neurologist at, at the local hospital. We've got James Williamson, who's a postdoc and, and a trained engineer. We've got um, Zach, who's, who's um, an American collaborator, who's the co-founder of the company of the devices. And we have the wonderful Dee, who's our, who's our project coordinator. So these are the group of people who really are the, the glue to the, to um to making this um this this project happen and so the, the broad goals of this program of research are to first understand how how movement is influenced by motor neuron disease how this varies across people or with the progression of the disease but we also want to use this information to then guide the design and application of these innovative mobility aids or exoskeletons to essentially improve improve movement so before we can apply any type of mobility aid, particularly one that interacts with the person wearing it, it's really important to understand how movement is, is influenced by motor neuron disease. And so I want to acknowledge these two amazing individuals, Corey and, and Georgia. Corey is a PhD candidate supervised by Derek and Shu. He's so, so nearly ready to hand in his, in his PhD thesis. 
Corey's interested in wearable sensors and how they can be used to classify movement. And he's led a lot of this, this data collection that I'm going to share over the next couple of slides. And Georgia is an honor student who's been supporting this project as well. And here are some images of what my gate lab at the University of Queensland looks like. So our space is equipped with some really state of the art equipment that allows us to measure how people with motor neuron disease move in more detail than ever before. We can think of these as characterizing movement signatures. And so what do we have? We've got 12 high-speed infrared cameras that allow us to track the motions of the joints and the limbs via these little reflective um, shiny markers that we place on the skin. Then we have this, this really um, exciting piece of equipment. It's a, a treadmill on steroids. So it's a, it's a split belt treadmill that has two force plates under the left and the right belts to record the forces of every step an individual takes. So we can look really closely about how a person interacts with their environment. We have handrails and a safety harness as well to ensure that individuals are not at risk of falls. Safety is of course the most important priority here. And so with this information, we can start to measure a person's movement. And so we can do this during walking. Here we're looking at two different individuals walking on a treadmill. These videos show the positions of all the little reflective markers placed on, on their skin. As you can see, they have very different walking patterns and, and levels of function. We can also do things like ask people to do more functional tasks like trans transfers or standing up from a chair on the treadmill. These little red arrows show the reaction forces under each of the limbs. But where things get even more exciting, well, if you're a biomechanics geek like me, is where we can create these digital twins that capture a person's size, their height, their mass, how long their legs are. And here you can see this digital model. All the leg muscles are represented by these blue, blue lines. And what we can use, or we can take these models one step further and combine them with the motions and the forces from our cameras and our treadmill and this is exciting because it allows us to understand movement in people with MND in more detail than we've ever been able to before. So what have we learned so far? Well, first we've learned that individuals with motor neuron disease tend to walk slower, take shorter strides, as well as less frequent strides. And I'll note that this is data from nine individuals with motor neuron disease and nine controls. So these are individuals of the same age and the same sex who do not have motor neuron disease. In this first graph, the gray bars are these control participants and the purple are motor neuron disease. Next, we've observed that people in mo with motor neuron disease walk with it about a twofold reduction in their ankle push-off power. Now, what do I mean by power? Well, imagine our muscles generate energy and the rate at which they can deliver that energy to their environment is their power. Think of this as like the wattage of our calf muscles. And we can see that these curves look very different. So here's the control participant shown in black. And in the blue and red lines are the left and the right legs, um, uh, the average of the right and the left legs um, across individuals with motor neuron disease. And what we can see is they don't look the same. So in other words, gait can be also quite asymmetrical, meaning the left and the right limb don't behave in the same way. And finally, these patterns appear to look very different across individuals with motor neuron disease. So here, each one of these different lines shows a different individual. And what you can see is a bunch of lines that all look quite different. And so what we're just starting to scrape the surface and, and learn is that movement is influenced by motor neuron disease, but it varies a lot between individuals. And the ankle appears to be the most important joint to consider for improved walking function. So then if I'm going to use an exoskeleton to assist walking, it makes sense to choose an exoskeleton that is worn at the ankle. And so these types of devices have already been used as mobility aids in other populations with some exciting results. So groups, including mine, have, have used these devices in healthy in, in, in control participants um, to show that they can offload our muscles and joints leading to an increase in their capacity. This is some of the work I did during my postdoc. And in people who've had a stroke, exoskeletons increase the, the function of the ankle and reduce the metabolic cost of walking. This means these individuals can push harder on the ground with their limbs without consuming as much energy. 
And so what does this look like in action? Well, here's an individual, um, here's a video of an individual who's who's had a stroke walking in an exo in an in in an exoskeleton. Um, this is the same device that we intend to use um, in in motor neuron disease. So here you can see them walking on the treadmill without the device to begin with. Their movement pattern is quite asymmetrical. You're soon going to see them move in the device. And what I hope you might be able to appreciate is that when this man uses the device, the treadmill is going a bit faster. There's less dragging of his foot along the treadmill belt and not shown in this short video, but this gait is less fatiguing. So he could continue to walk for longer. Let me just flick slides. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll wrap up with a bit of an overview of, of what's to come. This is a, a really new project. Our big goal is to use these devices called exoskeletons for the first time to improve movement in motor neuron disease. And what our hope is that this would allow for more independent, safer, and less exhausting walking. So the steps on this journey to do so are first, we wanna understand if people like wearing these devices. We'll ask questions like, would you wear them again? Were they comfortable? And if they were available to purchase, would you likely do so? Next, we want to measure how these devices influence the movement patterns of people with MND. Do they make moving easier? Do they make it safer? And do they make it less tiring? And finally, we'll work with engineers to make the necessary modifications or changes to these devices to ensure they're fit for perfect purpose. In other words, can we improve them to suit the individual and unique needs of a person with motor neuron disease? And this research really represents the first step towards moving exoskeletons from a research tool to a mobility aid for people living with motor neuron disease. But, and this is a big but, this requires a really collaborative effort, transdisciplinary people from multiple backgrounds with consistent user engagement. And that's really, really key um, to the, the success of this type of work. So with that, I will um, wrap up by thanking my, my wonderful collaborators. Um, the funding sources for this work are industry partner Biomotum, of course, the study participants, their families, friends and carers who've supported and continue to support this work. And I just will highlight if you're interested in, in supporting or discussing this research or getting involved, please do get in, in touch. We're just getting it off the ground. Um, and that's all I've got. I think we'll do questions at the end. And I'm going to pass the mic over to, to Ben O'Mara. Um, thanks so much, uh, Taylor. Um, and um, thanks so much to Derek, Gethin, Laura, Claire, and all the staff at MND Australia for the chance to present today. And many thanks to Fight MND and Perpetual Limited for the funding to do this work. And I just wanted to say too, uh, an extra thanks to Taylor and clearly to your uh, team doing some fascinating work at UQ. I feel like there's some really interesting links with some of your work on exoskeletons and the work I'll be talking about tonight. Um, so I'm Ben O'Mara. I'm a project manager at MND Australia. Um, to start my presentation, I'd like to acknowledge, celebrate and pay respect to the Ngunnawal and the Gambri people of the Canberra region and to all First Nations Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and work. And if you bear with me a moment, I'm just going to start up my presentation, my slides. Sorry, folks, just bear with me a moment. There we go. Wonderful. Derek, is that coming through okay? Uh, yep, it's looking very good. Excellent. Um, so I'd like to highlight before I begin that one of our team members is using augmented communication technology to participate. Um, if you could just uh, please be flexible with questions for us in terms of time. Um, we'll come back to you as soon as we can with responses where required. I'd also like to make a few other acknowledgements. Um, the first is my co-authors on a previous paper that explored uh, video games, creating video games that are more inclusive uh, with people with MND and who are the team working with me to drive this new project and are joining me tonight. Um, 
those, uh, they are Dr. Matthew Harrison from University of Melbourne, uh, Dr. Kirsten Harley from Sydney University and Dr. Natasha Dwyer from Victoria University. Uh, we, I like to think that we bring together a unique collection of expertise in games, digital media, social inclusion, health sociology and health communication. The second acknowledgement I'd like to make is everyone who contributed ideas to the funder project from the MND network so far. Those include people with MND and their loved ones who have been in touch with me to ask about controllers and other devices used to play games or share their experiences. Their questions have been excellent and they've helped to kickstart this work. Um, also, huge thanks to the Australia MND Facebook group, members of the SIG workshop in 2019, hosted by MND New South Wales, the Information Shared Services Group, and many staff at the MND Associations. And of course, the Project Advisory Group, Carol Burks, and the whole MND Australia team. I'm here tonight primarily representing MND Australia. At MND Australia, we work as the national pick body supporting people impacted by MND and on funding MND research and care, advocacy and policy and information development. I am also an adjunct research fellow at the University of New South Wales and at Swinburne University. And staff and researchers at both of those universities have been great supporters of this work, including Professor Anthony McCosca and Cleve Carvalho, the li liaison librarian for health arts and design at Swinburne. Tonight, I'm going to be sharing with you more about our project, some initial findings and lessons learned. Our project is a research and development project that aims to find ways of improving quality of life through video games that are more fun and easier to play with MND. We're hoping that this is a novel and enjoyable way of easing the boredom, stress and isolation from MND. In the following video, Kirsten shares her perspective about the joys and challenges of playing games with MND. I've worked with Kirsten for over four years now on a variety of information projects, but mo most recently on finding ways to make games more inclusive with MND. Back in 2012, I was a busy, active academic and mum. When I had time, I chilled out by playing a variety of puzzle games on my iPad or computer, and my mum, sisters and I enjoyed connecting by playing online Scrabble. During the year, I started cramping, and then tripping and falling, and my GP referred me to a neurologist for tests. Before we went back for results, we had a family summer holiday at Mum's, when we all stayed up much too late playing 500. On the 7th of January 2013, Denzel and I held hands in the neurologist's office as she gave us the devastating news that I have motor neuron disease. The neurologist explained that MMD is a progressive neurological disease affecting the motor neurons. As the nerve cells die, our muscles weaken and shrink, and we progressively lose the ability to move, speak, swallow and breathe. The pace and order of change vary widely, but typically people die within two to three years. The clinic nurse eloquently described MND as a shit sandwich of a disease. It has progressively stolen my strong, active body so that now I am unable to move apart from my face, unable to speak, and struggling to swallow. I am incredibly lucky that nearly three years ago I was resuscitated from catastrophic respiratory failure, and given a tracheotomy, and since then a ventilator has breathed for me and kept me alive. As my arms grew weaker I needed armrests cradling my arms to use a computer keyboard and found it easier to manipulate an iPad on my lap. With increasing difficulty moving my hands I transitioned to a smaller tablet, and then phone, and abandoned games which required speed. Finally I became unable to even tap or swipe the screen. For a while I settled on giving suggestions as my husband and young daughter created fabulous worlds in Minecraft where I shared the fun problem solving and appreciated the gorgeous design in a hands-free way as our family bonded during collective games of Monument Valley.
As Kirsten's wonderful video highlights, video games played on a variety of devices can be enjoyable with MND and a great way to have fun and spend time with others. Kirsten's story is reflected in a small but growing evidence base of studies involving people with MND using technology and video games. At the same time, significant challenges associated with MND can make playing video games much harder and risk worsening quality of life with the disease for those who enjoy them. Weakened muscles and fatigue can make it difficult to press buttons, hold smartphones and controllers and operate keyboards. Selecting in-game menus and screens becomes much harder. There's a gap in customized games for players with MND as well and limited opportunities to play and learn socially and game on with MND. Furthermore, few and poor quality opportunities uh, to enjoy um, video games um, uh, for people with MND reduces their ability to exercise their fundamental human rights. Despite these opportunities and challenges, currently there is no or very little work performed by the Australian government, disability agencies, recreation programs, video game and technology developers, and the MND network more broadly to address the interests of people with MND with video games. Evidence also suggests that there are only going to be more people who are gamers or interested in games that are diagnosed with MND in the future. Contrary to stereotypes and according to the Australia Plays 2023 report, 81% of all Australians play video games, with the average age of gamers being approximately 35 years old, indicating that adults who grew up playing games continue to be active players. This evidence suggests that in addition to existing players with MND, there are likely to be many more people with MND in the future who are gamers and who could benefit from the insights of this project. So our project aims to increase understanding of two things. What makes video games easier and more enjoyable to play alone and with others for improved quality of life with MND and how to work with people with MND to develop and determine the viability of a customized approach to playing video games with interface technology for improved quality of life and through opportunities for social participation with games. By meeting these aims, our hope is that the knowledge generated by the project can support the development of critical learning that can support a rollout of a nationwide program to the wider MND community about games and another viable evidence-based option to support improved quality of life for many people with MND. We also hope that we can support changes in practice by improving the capacity of MND, game and technology organisations to better support people living with MND and their recreational needs and ability to connect with it with others socially. At its heart, our project involves bringing together a group of people living with MND to help work through decisions and test out more inclusive games and technology with games, technology, allied health and community professionals. Our study uses an enhanced community-based participatory action research methodology, or CPAR, which has been shown to help when working with people living with MND on technology projects. It is a novel collaborative approach that creates processes for bringing together socially marginalized communities, organizations, and other stakeholders affected by an issue, and to find ways of improving health and wellbeing through social change and action. Use of CPAR for this project consists of four major components. They are involving people with MND in every aspect of major decision making for the project, an evidence review, a nationwide survey, and a series of participatory workshops developing a customized approach to interfaces and games and social opportunities to play games in the MND community. We have three workshops proposed and they will follow recommendations for a participatory and iteratively co-designed process. Participants will have opportunities to play games, try customized software and hardware interfaces for more enjoyable gaming and share their experiences. We're hoping to learn from them what does and does not work when playing customized games, as well as the process of how we're doing the project. Our proposed and major outcome of the project is that people with MND were involved in all levels of decision-making and as a result have shared what may or may not help make video games more fun and easier to play for improved quality of life. A secondary outcome is increased understanding of what helps make games more inclusive for improved quality of life with MND, which can then be used as a basis for future programs, policy and research that seeks to better meet the needs of the MND community. Practically though, what this project might lead to is an agreed on and customised form of game software that makes play easier with MND, 
say in game buttons that are easier to find and click or a slider or a setting to adjust speed of gameplay to slow it down if it's too fast. For example, as you can see on the screen, changing the menu options in game settings so that they are as easy to find and interact with as possible. Or agreed on recommendations for customizing controllers that makes play easier with MND. For example, grips for controllers on the Xbox adaptive controller or remappable buttons. And hopefully stories, reflections and information resources about games and MND that can be shared in a range of contexts and with useful tips. I'm going to hand you over now to Matt and Kirsten, who are going to do a short demonstration of some barriers to gameplay that we've been exploring. Is that OK, Matt? That is absolutely fine, Ben. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, and I think, Ben, just uh, as you were showing the Microsoft Adaptive Controller, I've actually got one here that I can hold up to the camera so everyone can see a bit closer. Um, what's really cool about this is just the way that it interfaces with existing switches and using technologies like this that have been designed or co-designed with people with the experiences of um, physical access needs. The things that you wouldn't think about, such as having integration with three and a half mil um, audio jacks so that people can use their existing switches and communication hardware. So rather than having to reinvent the wheel, it's so people with their support workers can set this up really easily. And that's what we're really focused on in, in bringing that value of lived experience. Speaking of lived experience, I was just going to show an example of a game um, it's great working with Kirsten, Tash, and Ben. We get to road test lots of games. It's a pretty fun job. I'm just going to share my screen very quickly and just show you an example of a game that did have some, um, some praise in the media for its accessibility functions, but a game that when Kirsten tried it, and I think Kirsten might be working in the chat at the same time, found it to be extremely frustrating. So I'm just going to now share my screen. And, okay, I'm just going to check uh, that you can see my desktop. Fantastic. And you can see my phone, Ben, is that correct? All right. So this is Diablo uh, Immortal, a mobile game that we heard wonderful things about in terms of accessibility. It's an action role-playing game. What you'll notice as it starts up is just how small the buttons are. So if you're using adaptive, if you're using some sort of augmented uh, input and controller input, um, it can be really hard even just to navigate the menus. And I've uh, got a save spot, Ben. You can see here um, on the lower um, lower right-hand corner, these are the buttons that we're using with the virtual D-pad. This is really hard to use while using something like eye gaze technology. So if you're using something like uh, a Microsoft uh, Kinect sensor or something with higher fidelity to control this game, it can be really, really difficult. So settings like screen resolution, Things are like using, um, even just having, needing to push two buttons at once. These are things that can create barriers. We're looking at how you could use things like artificial intelligence potentially, and this is some great work that Natasha Dwyer is doing, to be able to assist the player or co-pilot um, a game. So someone who uh, has physical access needs can play alongside someone else or an AI assistant to still be able to access the game. Uh, I'll just stop sharing now, Ben. Um, there we go, I can see everyone again. I'm not sure if there's more time for examples or whether you would like to, uh, to share on with Tash. So thank you, Matt. That was, um, uh, it was really clear to me, um, some of those barriers and um, it, it's just great to have a chance to talk more about um, perhaps the, you know, where the rubber meets the road and, you know, where the hype is versus the reality, particularly for people with MND, 
um, who were interested in playing games. Um, and I think that to me, that was quite clear in that video. Um, before I move to my next slide, I just thought um, just some of your, just checking with Tash to see if there's anything you wanted to add, Tash, to what uh, Matt mentioned about AI there. Um, folks, Tash has been leading some very important work um, focused on AI, but, uh, but Matt may have covered off on it, but is there anything you wanted to add there, Tash? Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ken. Um, would like to add that we're trying to be opportunistic with what we're seeing out there. And then as Ben was discussing, using the CPAR method to match if there, if indeed the evolving tech can, is of use and thinking about the procedures of how we can save time in a workshop, which I know sounds trivial and mundane, but how do we, how do we use, how do we present options in a way that um, is not predetermining what people might like to do with AI? Thanks. Thanks, Tash. That's a wonderful way to um, chat about CPAR and how we see it as a way of um, learning from participants about what, what they're using every day and um, what they're interested in and changing as a result. So thanks so much, Tash and Matt and Kirsten. I'm going to push on to the next slide because I'm conscious of, of, of time. So I'm just going to attempt to share my screen again. So bear with me a moment. And just while you're loading your slides, Ben, if anyone has any questions or comments, um, I can see there's a Q&A function here as well. So Tash and Kirsten and myself can answer those questions as you speak, as you speak to the slides. That would be awesome. Thank you, Matt. Teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so the current status of our project, um, so as Matt and Tash and Kirsten have sort of uh, shared, is that we are... One aspect of our project is we get to do a lot of uh, playtesting of games and and we've also been experimenting with um, AI. Um, but um, in terms of the rest of the project, the current status is that we're still waiting for ethics clearance. Um, the delay is due to unexpected staff leave in ACT Health who are responsible for the ethics process. Uh, but we have been very busy with other aspects of the project. We've just completed um, the first draft of our evidence review for the project to help inform and guide our, our workshops. Uh, we looked at academic studies, but also technical guidelines, community surveys, news reports, and stories about games and technology by people living with MND. And a lot of previous work explored new and emerging technology and explored games with other recreation activities like smart home devices, brain computer interfaces, touch and eye, co eye control devices and tablet computers. Past work also included technology that has the potential for games because it could be used with for communication and controlling computers and other devices. Some of that technology included virtual assistants, voice banking, computers, robots, webcams, switches, and adaptive controllers, and low-tech forms uh, like boards, tables, and armrests also showed potential. So after a comprehensive search, we what we found is that the evidence base is small but promising for future work. And we identified 23 publications over the last 10 years that included the views of 399 people with MND, their carers and loved ones, and 323 of those people um, were people with MND. And many participants um, shared common experiences with communication technology um, and games, particularly uh, for how they can shape quality of life. Uh, some of the most common were feelings of joy and pleasure when playing games and using technology more generally, such as being able to reduce boredom, spend time with others, enjoy music and videos, or feel more independent when being able to communicate. Um, and another common uh, common theme was that there were difficulties too with games and technology that led to feelings of frustration, like gameplay that was hard to enjoy or navigate, having limited understanding of what games and technology are available, and devices taking too much time to set up and adjust settings, as Matt wonderfully illustrated there with his example of the adaptive controller and simply the ports at the back, uh, knowing how to best uh, work with those can actually take time and that can be quite frustrating. So the experiences that we learned from past literature reflected some of the things we've learned from those who have uh, expressed they'd like to get, it, get involved in our project, uh, um, Game On with MND. So more broadly in past work though, there were two 
uh, major themes identified, and those were that user participation in communication technology development can make video games easier to play for improved quality of life with MND. And secondly, greater collaboration and much more user-focused design in research and development can help to make changes to video games and related technology for improving quality of life with MND. And the other really, uh, I guess, new thing that we found from looking at past evidence, um, and this is coming from, again, uh, what people with MND have expressed as part of qualitative research um, in, about communication technology, including games, is some very specific potential changes. And they are more accessible uh, communication technology generally, but also more accessible gameplay and graphical interfaces in video games on a range of devices, shorter setup and adjustment times for games and other technology, and more technical support and advice, including those relevant uh, to games. Uh, we expect to find more potential changes as we learn from the MD community here in Australia through our workshops. So, um, to close off, um, we hope that ethics clearance is granted soon, that we can begin our workshops and survey for our project. But if you or someone you know uh, know of might be interested in participating, it would be great to hear from you uh, via my contact details on the screen there. I can share more information with you about the project and how we plan to run workshops. We aim as Tash was talking about, uh, we're trying to find ways to run workshops that involve games testing and uh, chatting about experiences with games in a way that's really flexible and reduces the burden on, ex on participants as much as possible. And we have been meaningfully exploring the role of AI in that context. Um, so with workshops, um, you know, we're looking to organize them on times and days that suit participants and try to allow plenty of time to play in test games and technology and chat with others. We're also developing what we call, a, what we're calling a feedback loop, uh, which is designed to allow a range of people interested in the project to share ideas and suggestions at times that suit them and in an ongoing way. Say for example, if a person living with MND comes up with a great idea for a workaround in a game in the lead up to a workshop, or if a technology developer spots a unique unique feature or change that might be relevant to the project. So uh, thank you once again, everyone, for your time. Um, um, I and my colleagues hope this presentation was useful and supports more people to game on with MND. And if it's okay, Derek, I might hand over to you now. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, Matt, thank you very much, Tash, as well as Kirsten. That was a wonderful presentation. I think I learned a lot tonight. Uh, Secret Squirrels, I actually saw some of this uh, at the end of last year at the national meeting as well, and I really loved it then as well. Also, thank you very much, Taylor, for your wonderful presentation. We've had a little bit of chat going on in the background with some Q&A coming up. Um, and so I might actually, just for those of you who haven't been following that, um, quickly push a question out to Ben, seeing as he's just finished discussing his study. Um, which is really about the types of games available. I mean, I'm an oldie. I love things like the old school <laughs> Mario, Tetris, all those kind of games. What kind of variety of games are you looking at? What can people expect hopefully soon or in the future? Great question, Derek. And I just want to emphasize that it's okay to love retro games. I love a lot of retro games and enjoy them now. Um, there's a few aspects a few ways I'd like to answer that question um, in terms of games that are available and perhaps what's coming down the pipeline. One thing I think it's important to uh, just um, emphasize, and I learned this from what I call some initial consultations in the MD community, including with allied health professionals and others, and that is to really try to think about it from the perspective of people living with MND and the things they like, they're into, and their capabilities. Um, so we've learned that um, there are some people living with MND who might like to play certain kinds of uh, games that are perhaps, um, what's the word, more like they might like platform games uh, or they might like um, first person uh, games or role playing games. Then there's some players who like um, perhaps if, like Kirsten showed the video of Monument Valley. I'm a big fan of Monument Valley. It's a lovely puzzle game. Some like card games. 
Um, so I think it's important to learn the perspective of people living with MND first. Um, but the, we do know there are, at the moment, what evidence is telling us, and by evidence I mean some of those past studies and also what we're learning as we go along the way, that there do seem to be some kinds of games that are better, that are easier to play um, uh, with MND. And often some of those games include, in addition to some of those hardware challenges that um, uh, Matt showed us, games where they're, um, they're turn-based or they're, um, they're, they, there are more options for manage to manage the speed and time um, in the game. So, for example, uh, games like Civilization um, or turn-based games mean that users have more time to select options, to press buttons and to find uh, what they need on the screen and also in terms of hardware. Um, having said that, um, and I, what I might do is actually turn to Matt, Kirsten and or Tash and probably probably Matt to comment on this, is that we are seeing, and I think this is in terms of games coming down the pipeline in terms of the future, we are seeing, I believe, um, some interesting trends in commercial um, video game companies. And I'm thinking about the example of Diablo 4. Now, Matt showed us an example of a mobile version of Diablo, but we do know that there's some interesting accessibility features in some of the biggest um, and most popular games like Diablo 4. Um, and But Matt, I thought I might, um, if it's all right, swing perhaps, um, and if this is right, Derek, perhaps uh, hand over to you to comment on that because I think some of your uh, insights here are really important. Yeah, absolutely. Very happy to chat. And, and Kirsten and Tash, please jump in if I missed anything. Um, just first of all, Derek, I am a massive retro gaming nerd. I've got my <laughs> Mario uh, 8-bit Ness in my office. My office is full of gaming memorabilia. Uh, so they can never move me uh, because <laughs> there's too much stuff to move in my office. Um, I think what's really important is the idea that people have like their own preferences and the idea of thinking about how can we let people keep doing what they loved, uh, you know, in, in, their, in their past life before motor neuron disease sort of impacted upon their ability to play. And so Ben spoke about these different genres, but we're really also interested in allowing people to meet people at where they're at in terms of where they want to play. And that's really important. And that's as part of the co-design process. Uh, and we see games like Diablo 4, which did get a lot of credit because they were doing, it's, it's really thought about a diversity of players. And I, I personally believe that's come about because the games industry um, has been hiring more uh, people with different backgrounds, different life experiences, and have started valuing, and that brings different values. And it's thinking more broadly about who plays games. And it's, it's getting, getting away from those stereotypes of, of people like myself. You know, yes, I play games, but we know, for example, 50% are female, as, as Ben said earlier in the presentation. And the idea that there's going to be people with different physical access needs. And because we've got a more diverse crowd making games now, we also have uh, games that are more accommodating or have more features such as the people who can only play uh, with eye gaze technology. So Diablo 4 is a really good example that you can have simplified control schemes. The PlayStation 5 has this co-pilot mode. So um, Kirsten and I could play together in Minecraft and I could control part of the game and Kirsten control part of the game and we could make a single player game, a two player game by having different functions of the, um, of the controller set to different devices, which is really cool. I don't know, Ben, did you want me to speak about some of the interface things we've found about how some of the older games are better? I can. That you... sounds cool. If we have time, I'm just conscious yeah. of um, a wonderful answer. Yeah, Thank I am you, Matt. Mindful um, that we we have we have only about five minutes or so left. Course, so what yeah. we might do is come back to that, uh, if you don't mind. Of course. Um, yeah. There's a really interesting conversation happening in the Thank background you, Matt, no. uh, between uh, Taylor and Keith, and I I do want to touch on that because I think Keith, you've mentioned something very important there. Uh, which is um, these assistive devices that Taylor's group would like to introduce have, of course, benefit in terms of helping people walk for longer. Uh, but there seems to be a window of opportunity um, and it may not necessarily benefit everybody, especially if they're outside of that window. But I guess, Taylor, the question to add to that conversation is, do you think that these devices could provide a way in which to 
potentially uh, preserve movement for longer, but also delay the decline in movement that would normally occur. Thanks, Derek, and and thanks, Keith, for the wonderful questions. I'm enjoying this. Um, I think that's the that's the the hope is that if we can enable individuals to be mobile and move their limbs for longer periods of time, um, can we slow the progression of the disease? I, I think that's a big unanswered question that we would hope to to get to eventually. Probably not in this first project, but um, you know, I think that's there is um, potential for that. That's been shown in, in other um, neurodegenerative disorders, albeit um, MND is is um, is very different in that typically, um, you know, movement progresses very differently among, among within individuals and, and through time. But I think that there is um, the potential for these devices to, to slow the progression, at least that's what I'm hoping. Uh, Taylor, you've touched on something a number of times now, which is you keep saying that our understanding of MND is so poor. Why do you think MND has been overlooked when it comes to research into movement and uh, the use of assistive devices? I think so. I was quite surprised. And, you know, Derek, when you and I sort of embarked on this and we, we looked into the literature and found so little information on, you know, really any biomechanical or physiological measures related to movement in this population. And by movement, I mean, typically walking or, you know, tasks of daily living. And I think it, it hasn't been necessarily a priority for the field because there's been bigger fish to fry, right? You know, um, pharma, pharma, pharmaceutical treatments and, um, you know, identifying um, the, the causes of the disease. Like there, there has been um, potentially, you know, other focuses um, that have have been the priority. The field needs more funding, like like all fields do, right? Um, and and so I think that's potentially why. But there's definitely a, a big gap in our knowledge of how motor neuron disease influences these more detailed signatures of of movement, which is, you know, the if you look into the post stroke literature or cerebral palsy or even Parkinson's, there's huge amounts of data on how movement changes throughout progression of the disease and, and with severity and and this, you know, it makes us think a little bit of could we use some of this information as potential biomarkers of disease and its progression, which um, is an exciting avenue for future exploration, I think. Thank you very much, Taylor. Now, what I'm going to do is pivot this back to Matt and Ben, because I, I as I was listening, I came up with a very interesting question, which is you're, you're teaching the eyes, the brain to use devices to control something on a screen. Uh, do you think this technology can be applied to move something in the real world? So in other words, do you think you can use the same approach to help people move uh, a character on a screen to maybe move well, a small robot? At home? If I can jump in, Matt, but please jump. No, uh, I'll, I'll have a go, and Matt, if you jump in when you're if you're ready, or Tash or Kirsten, to come back to the evidence, Derek, um, from the recent review of um, uh, literature on quality of life, MND, and games and communication technology. I remember one of the studies was specifically about um, a robotic system. Um, I remember that, and the reason why it was included was because the um, uh, users of the system um, were there was a, a graphical interface on a screen um, and some of the potential enhancements there were around I don't mean I mean this in a positive way just like potentially larger buttons easier graphical interfaces and that robotic system uh, was being used to, for daily activities things like picking up a smartphone um, picking up a cup picking up food and also things like um, like scratching parts of the body that get itchy. Um, and again, just off memory, there were strengths and limitations to the study. Um, but, you know, for example, that sense of relief that comes uh, when having a level of independence from using robotics technology like that. I actually thought of that study when I was listening to Taylor's um, presentation in terms of some of the links with um, exoskeletons. So to answer your question, yes, but there are some limitations as well. So there could be ways to get the way I see it 
to combine um, some of the learning that happens um, and software and hard development in games for operating and you know interacting with virtual environments as well as real world environments. Um, one thing I'm just very conscious on too, just following on from that though, Derek, is this idea that we keep coming back to as a group is that gaming is such a social experience as well. Uh, it's such a, um, well, people love hanging out and talking about games. Like Matt and Kirsten spent time developing a character in that Diablo game. Like, it's, you know, it's fun. It's, um, we feel there are interesting ways to, when it comes to this idea of real life. So yes, not just in terms of interacting with objects, but I also like to think of real life as the social fabric, as games being this incredibly wonderful, fun way of connecting people. Matt, did you want to comment on that? And Derek, I just, I'm just sort of steering towards Matt a bit here because a lot of Matt's leadership and work and one of the reasons I got in touch with Matt as well as Tash and Kirsten is because his work in social inclusion more broadly. Matt, did you want to comment there? Um, no, I think, I think, yeah, I just saw that um, uh, Keith in the chat, uh, Derek was saying about how he, they had the opportunity to drive a robot um, controlled via eye gaze. And yet there's no reason you couldn't do uh, things in the, you know, have something in the virtual world controlling something in the physical world. Uh, we do this all the time, like the Mars rovers were controlled through a virtual interface um, on Mars. So surely on Earth we can have someone uh, using eye gaze to be able to control a drone or a robot. And I think it's an exciting time to be in this space. There's a lot of things we can do with this technology. I, I think one thing that I like to come back to is um, there's some really important quality of life things we could do with this technology. Uh, and one of those is fun. <laughs> Sometimes uh, fun is just understated about how important fun it is and joy. Um, and that's the joy of playing with friends and, and loved ones. Um, I, I think that in itself is a wonderful objective. I see, Kirsten, I think you're saying yes, which is great. Yeah. Um that's wonderful. Thank you very much. And what I might do, I realize it's just after the hour now. Um, I always love leaving talks at a, at a high point, And I think that certainly is a high point, a reminder of just how important it is every now and then to step out and have fun. I have a two-year-old upstairs. I'm going to go play with her and have some fun now. And so when I finish, I just would like to really thank you, Ben. Thank you, Matt. Um, thank you, Tash, and especially thank you, Kirsten. I really enjoyed that video. It was very inspirational as well, and also to see how you've been able to re-engage with games. Um, I really enjoyed watching the talks tonight, seeing how uh, people are engaging with technology to really improve quality of life with M&D. And I'm really hoping that there can be a good investment so we can move these things along much, much faster. Um, quick reminder for everybody else watching tonight that you will receive a link to this recording. Uh, please feel free to distribute this link across your networks to people who might be interested, um, but also uh, recognize that you can go to the m and Australia website, m and australiaorgau forward slash research uh, to also access all of the historical links and any other set of plate talks that may have occurred in the past. Uh, keep an eye on for the next one as well. And with that, again, just thank you very much for our speakers tonight. Um, and um, Hopefully everybody has enjoyed this as much as I have. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night.